Thank you. We turn to topical questions and we start with <coughs> question number one from Ben McPherson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action is being taken in Scotland following the recent terrorist attack in London. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. President Officer, I offer my heartfelt condolences to all those affected by the dreadful incident in London on the evening of the 3rd of June. Following the incident in London, the First Minister chaired a meeting of the Scottish Government's Resilience Committee, which included Police Scotland, to consider the impact of the incident and the required response here in Scotland. The First Minister has also received a briefing from the Deputy National Security Advisor. The Scottish Government officials are engaged with UK Government officials to keep the implications for Scotland under review. As with the response to the incident in Manchester, Police Scotland increased the visibility of armed and unarmed officers on the streets in Scotland over the course of the weekend. Follow, further uh, events taking place in Scotland over the next 14 days have also been reviewed to ensure that the right level of policing is in place to meet operational requirements and also to provide public reassurance. Planning for the general election is included within this review. However, security me measures are only one part of the solution. The responsibility to tackle violent extremism is one we all share. The most important challenge for us all is to work towards creating cohesive and resilient communities within which the terrorist message will not resonate. In times of adversity, our communities in Scotland have shown that they will stand side by side to send a shared message of tolerance and of unity. Thank you. Ben McPherson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And like him, all of our thoughts, I'm sure, are, and condolences are, are with the London victims at this time, their families and their communities. Following the terror attack in Manchester on the 22nd of, of May, and in, in London on Saturday, the 3rd of June. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the Scottish Government and Police Scotland will continue to work closely and engage with communities across Scotland to provide reassurance and ensure no communities feel marginalised, isolated or vulnerable? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I can, President Officer. In the wake of the terrorist attack in Manchester on the 22nd of June, and the uh, attack in London on Saturday evening. Uh, the Scottish Government and Police Scotland have continued to engage uh, with communities across Scotland to provide reassurance and also to ensure no communities feel marginalised, isolated uh, or vulnerable. Uh, Police Scotland continue to monitor hate crime incidents on a daily basis and review these on a regular basis to identify any significant rise in tensions within communities. So I can give the member an assurance that this is work which the Scottish Government and Police Scotland and their other partners will continue to take forward to ensure uh, that those who may wish to peddle a message of hate or to exploit these situations, that they are not able to do so in our communities here in Scotland. Ben McPherson. I thank the Cabinet, Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And in his first answer, he talked about community cohesion which is clearly extremely important in ensuring that there is one Scotland where people live in peace. Can he outline what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that Scotland is a welcoming place for all of those who have chosen to make Scotland their home? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, as a nation, we've got a long and proud history of welcoming people uh, to our country from various nationalities and uh, faiths and we as a government are continued to committed continued to being committed to supporting uh, integration into our communities here in Scotland. It's vital that we continue as a country to send out a very strong uh, welcoming message that Scotland is a place where you are welcome uh, and you're particularly welcome if you've chosen to make your home here. Um, over a number of years now, we've invested in a range of different measures in order to make Scotland a welcoming place, including investing over £100 million since 2021 in promoting equality and in tackling discrimination. Uh, we've also published the Race Equality Framework for Scotland, which is about promoting race equality and tackling uh, racism. Uh, we also have Scotland's first 
uh, New Scots uh, Refugee Int Integration Strategy, which ran from 2014 to March 2017. These are measures which we've taken forward in order to make Scotland that welcoming place and a place where uh, hate crime has no place. And as a government, we'll continue to work with agencies ensuring that that message is taken forward. Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And could I add the thoughts of the Scottish Conservatives to the condolences which have been expressed by the Cabinet Secretary and Mr McPherson to those affected by this most recent atrocity and also place on record our uh, grateful thanks to the reaction of the emergency services in both London and Manchester. Uh, while no one wishes to see uh, a further increase in the number of armed officers across Scotland, if it is required, and we earlier in this parliamentary term did see an uplift in the number of armed officers, what assistance and support will Police Scotland require if there is a further need for a further uplift in armed officers across Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, as I set out to Parliament uh, last June, uh, following an assessment of the level of firearms capability that Police Scotland had, Following the attacks, the uh, terrible attacks that took place in Paris in 2015, it was identified that a further uplift in firearms capability should be deployed within Police Scotland. Since that statement was made to Parliament, Police Scotland have been undertaking an extensive training programme in order to uh, have an increase in their firearms capability. That work is now at a very advanced level. And as a member will have noted in the last 10 days, Police Scotland have also stepped up their firearms capability to the level which was necessary for critical, uh, which demonstrates the level of capacity uh, that Police Scotland now have in their firearms capability as they were able to do so without requirement for any military support in meeting that demand. Um, I'm confident from the information which we've, which we've been provided with by Police Scotland that they believe their existing firearms capability is uh, sufficient to meet uh, existing needs. However, as with all of these things, they are kept under constant review. And should Police Scotland feel there's a requirement for that to change yet again in the future, that's a matter which will require to be considered not only by this Parliament, but by the public of Scotland and also stakeholders across the country. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. Uh, we are all shocked at the attack at the weekend and our thoughts are with the victims and their families. Uh, this is the third terror incident within three months that we have had to experience. And while it is right that the focus is on the capacity and the deployment of our police officers and our intelligence service, um, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what advice the Scottish Government can give to people who may be feeling vulnerable after witnessing the terrible events on Saturday night, but who have also taken strength from watching the concert in Manchester on Sunday evening? Cabinet Secretary. So, enough, so one of the early actions that was undertaken by Police Scotland following the uh, terrible incident in Manchester and also in uh, London was to deploy specialist officers at our transport hubs to meet any individuals who had travelled from Manchester, who had witnessed the events and also who had travelled from London, who may have witnessed the events on Saturday night in order to provide them with any advice or information and to take any information that they may have that could help to support the investigation. That information is then shared with the uh, lead uh, agency that's responsible for investigating these matters in Manchester, Gator Manchester Police, uh, and in London, uh, the Metropolitan uh, Police. Alongside that, advice is provided on where they can get support through uh, the NHS, uh, and through their GP services, and to specialist support for, uh, uh, for anything that they may have witnessed. Uh, that support is also there for those who may have witnessed some of these scenes on social media. I'm particularly conscious of that with the incident which took place in Manchester, given the number of young people uh, who were involved in that incident uh, and who, have, who may have been uh, particularly interested in uh, the concert in itself. Uh, and advice was provided to our local authorities through our education departments and on to schools and also through our health services to make sure that any young person who was seeking advice or support that there was uh, an avenue and a pathway in which they could go into in order to get that advice and support. Uh, and that information was disseminated as widely as possible through our schools uh, and through our health service. Question number two, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what efforts it is undertaking to comply with freedom of information requests. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. Thank you. Scotland has the most open and far-reaching freedom of information laws in the UK. We take our responsibility for FOI seriously and in the large majority of cases we respond on time and in full. 
The Scottish Government is open and transparent about how it deals with FOI requests. All of our guidance is in the public domain. Jamie Green. Uh, thank the Minister for that response. In April of this year, Rosemary Agnew, the former Scottish Information Officer, ordered ministers to improve their performance following a number of, and I quote, totally unacceptable failures to respond to requests, adding that she was dissatisfied with their performance and would respond with the full force of the law. She launched a formal intervention to force improvements and will be closely monitoring responses until September of this year. So therefore, can I ask uh, the Minister, what will the Scottish Government do to raise its game whilst it's been monitored? Minister. Thank you for the, the question. Performance over recent years is consistently better than the 61% achieved under the last full year of the previous administration. The volume of requests had, has increased steadily over the years. In 2015, the Scottish Government received 2,155 requests, an increase of 173% since 2007. And, and um, even so, a, a record 1,674 responses were issued on time in 2015 and 1,557 in 2016. That's compared to just 684 responses on time in 2006. And in recent months, the, the number have spiked dramatically. We've received 777 requests in the first quarter of 2017 compared to 524 requests in the first quarter of 2016. By April this year, we'd received more requests in 2017 than were in, received in the, the whole of 2007. That said, we are committed to improving our response times and are working with the Commissioner's Office to that end. Jamie Green. Uh, I appreciate that very long list of statistics, but, Presiding Officer, how telling is it that just 40 hours before we exercise our biggest manifestation of democracy that we have to bring this to the Scottish Parliament to question the transparency of an SNP-led government. Last week, journalists from across the political spectrum, The Guardian, Common Space, The Times, The Courier, The Daily Mail, The Herald, The Telegraph, I could go on, signed a letter to the Scottish Parliament's selection panel for the next Scottish Information Officer. In this letter, they outline a number of concerns over the Scottish Government's use of legislation which undermines openness and accountability. Clearly, this practice is not sustainable in a mature democracy. So can I ask the Minister again if he understands the need for transparency and will the government, the Scottish Government, commit to addressing all six of the concerns outlined in this letter? Minister. The Scotland has, as I, as I said earlier, the most open and far-reaching freedom of information laws across the UK. Um, and we are um, determined that we continue to Im imp improve um, our performance and um, continue to um, make more information available. Um, if we can compare the amount of information we uh, release here in Scotland to what happens in the rest of the UK. So in Scotland, in 2016, the last full year, 85% of valid requests um, received information, um, either completely or at least in part, where we held the relevant information. Compare that to the rest of the UK, only 63% of the, the um, UK government departments have released information. So, so we have widely, widely recognised as being the most robust FY regime in these islands, and that is something that the Information Commissioner noted in her special report, and, and she, she made the point that Scotland is ahead of the international field in that area. But we are, we are determined to continue to work to improve those response times. But um, here in Scotland, we, we certainly release more information than anywhere else in, in the UK. And Mike Rumble. Does the Minister accept that there is real suspicion that the Scottish Government is trying to circumvent the freedom of information legislation by failing to record meetings that it had previously recorded and that the secrecy is not conducive to good government? Minister. Um, I think there's a, a question tomorrow on this particular topic, um, but I, I can confirm that um, the um, Scottish Government proactively publishes lots of information about ministerial engagements and information on the date, purpose, attendees and subject of those engagements. And, and that's something which is, was brought in by, by this government but that, that did not used to happen. Form, formal minutes are taken at, at meetings um, where uh, discussions are on substantive government business, where policy decisions arise or where there are significant action points all in line with the ministerial code. Thank you. Question number three, Edward Mountain. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the impact will be of the planned closure of the police control room in Inverness and its move to Dundee will be. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, decisions on the uh, operation of individual police control rooms are the responsibility of the Scottish Police Authority. Uh, Scottish ministers are clear that any such decision must be subject to appropriate assurance including external scrutiny, in order to ensure that the impact of any change is fully understood. I understand a decision on the transfer of control room functions from Inverness to Dundee is now expected to be made on the 24th of August 2017. Edward Mountain. Uh, thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for that. In 2015, when the Inverness Police Control Room was last threatened with closure, HM Inspector of Constabulary said that diverting calls away from the control room was creating additional risk. Given that the recent failings, failings in control at Police Scotland, I am not convinced the risks have been eradicated. How will the Scottish Government convince the people living in the Highlands and Islands that they have been? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, uh, the member highlights a particular issue which was highlighted in the assurance review that was carried out by HMICS and published in 2015, uh, which I directed uh, the HMICS to carry out. However, he may also be aware that there was an updated report uh, published in January of this year, which highlighted very significant progress and improvements that have been made by Police Scotland in their call handling arrangements and that a significant number of the recommendations that had been made by HMICS had been discharged as a result. The 16 of them being discharged, 12 partially discharged, and only two still outstanding. They also confirmed that the model which was being proposed was still an appropriate model that was being taken forward by Police Scotland, eh, and that the HMICS continue to be part of the assurance process before any further change is undertaken. So I think it's important to keep in mind, although there were original issues highlighted in the report that the member refers to in 2015, there has been a significant amount of work undertaken during that period of time, and the updated report from HMICS confirms the significant improvements which have been made. Edward Mountain. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I mean, history has taught me that in an emergency, command and control should be as close to an incident as, pro as possible. Why does the Scottish Government therefore think that it would be sensible, a sensible idea for incidents in Caithness and Sutherland to be dealt with in the first instance by a control room in Dundee? That's 240 miles away. That's hardly local. And I don't think he's dealt with the other problems that, that were brought up within the report. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I can only presume that the member wasn't aware of the actual content of the report that was published in January, which actually highlighted the very significant progress that we made in all of these areas, which is undertaken independently by HMICS in looking at what is the best model, what's the most appropriate model, and whether Police Scotland have addressed the issues that were highlighted in the original review report, which the member has just made reference to. Alongside that, the Scottish Police Authority have their external review of these changes as well, which reports to the Scottish Police Authority, which has to be agreed upon and considered before any final decisions can be made on these particular issues. And the very reason that Police Scotland have moved to the 3C models is in order to provide a much more comprehensive contact canned and control system than what was there previously with the eight legacy forces. So what I would do is I would just encourage the member to consider the update report that was published by HMS, HMICS in January, which demonstrates the very significant progress which the member seems to choose to wish to ignore. John Finney. Um, thank you, President Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I, I think the issue of local knowledge is often uh, played up quite a bit, but I certainly share the view that this is a backward step for, for communications. I take some reassurance, in fact, considerable reassurance from the role of the inspectorate. What we know is the facility remains, and we've been previous assurances about its role for criminal convictions and vehicle records. Can you confirm that that's still the case? And also, as a general principle, and I know, I'm aware you don't wish to intrude on operational police matters, but as a general principle, would you believe that public bodies, including Police Scotland, when opportunities and technologies exist, they take the opportunity to disperse jobs to areas like Inverness and indeed Dumfries? 
Cabinet Secretary. So, no, sir, in the member's latter point, yes, I do agree. We have the technology and the ability to be able to do so, uh, so long as it can also provide operational reassurance uh, uh, in the deployment of resources and in responding to incidents as and when that is required. As the member will be aware, um, in moving towards the 3C model, uh, one of the aspects that Police Scotland were considering having established at Inverness is the National Database Inquiry Unit. My understanding is that that is still Police Scotland's intention, that the National Database Inquiry Unit will be uh, largely based at, uh, at uh, Inverness. However, alongside that, they are looking at the existing arrangements which they also have uh, for national inquiries at Govan uh, to see whether there is a, a partnership arrangement that should be in place. Uh, and my understanding is that this will then be considered by the, uh, the Scottish Police Authority in due course to make a final decision on whether it will be one single uh, national database or whether it will be across two bases. But it will involve uh, having some of that provision uh, being uh, delivered in Inverness. And Liam MacArthur. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And while I share uh, many of Edward Mountain's uh, concerns, they're just some of the reasons why the Scottish Liberal Democrats uh, did not support the creation of a single centralised police uh, force, a centralisation uh, proposed by the Conservatives in their manifesto leading up to the 2011 uh, election. Will the Cabinet Secretary confirm whether or not, in supporting the creation of Police Scotland, there were any amendments lodged by the Conservatives calling for or demanding the retention of the control room in Inverness or other parts of the country? Cabinet Secretary. Um, so, no, sir, uh, I wasn't the Cabinet Secretary for Justice that dealt with that particular piece of legislation, uh, but I don't recall any specifically um, off the top of my head. And I think the member does make a good point, although uh, uh, the Conservative Party are often keen to criticise the single force that was in their manifesto uh, uh, prior to that election. And that concludes topical questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion 5982. In the name of Margaret Mitchell, on behalf of the Justice Committee, on its inquiry into the role and purpose of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, I would invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now.